right, we are live. So first of all, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for uh, yet another day of Open Branding Month. Um, as you guys might know, in lieu of doing our physical event this year, we've decided to give you a little bit of a daily dose of branding, let's say. Um, not only with our free masterclasses on rebelsrulers.com, which uh, there's a new one every day, but also with our live Q&A sessions like the one we have today with some of some of our really great speakers that we've we've gotten to know and love over over the years. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to I'm going to introduce them real quick. So uh, first of all, we have Richard. So Richard is the managing director and founder of The Clearing. And if you guys haven't seen their work, you really you really should look it up. Um, and Anurag is former global brand comms director at Heineken. And right now he's doing some incredible work when it comes to digital transformation for really large brands. So that means that we have here two guys that know, I would say a little something about, uh, let's say creative yet effective growth strategies. So that's probably what I'm gonna pick their brain on um, for the next, for the next, uh, for the next little while, let's put it that way. Um, now, as you all know, I have my questions uh, as always uh, that I wanna ask the guys, but definitely if you have any along the way, please don't hesitate to send them over. Use either the Q&A function on the Zoom or the chat in Facebook and I'll be sure to introduce them wherever, wherever I can. So let's get started. Um, first of all, welcome guys. Thank you very much you. for being here. Um, Thanks, Good to be here. Thanks for inviting us. <laughs> um, I do. I do want to start with a question that I I sometimes start with, um, just to lay a little bit because there are also two of you here. So I think it would be nice for the audience to hear maybe where you stand when it comes to some very foundational, uh, uh, very foundational parts of, of of what branding is. So I'm going to ask a seemingly simple question, which is never simple, but <laughs> I apologize in advance. Um, but how would each of you define the word brand and how do you consider it has evolved, let's say, over recent years? I don't want to nitpick just this year, but I want to maybe talk about how you've seen it uh, evolve over some of the years that have passed. And, and I can, I'm, I don't know, Anurag, if you want to start and then, and then sure. maybe Richard can follow. Yeah, so I'll I'll kind of kick it off. So I think for um, for me, the idea of a brand is it's kind of a, it's I see it more like a layers of meaning that you attach to a, to a product or service that makes it relevant and attractive to somebody else that you want to serve with. And for me, the idea of layers of meaning means that you can basically add different levels of value which could begin at a very functional it's a mark that basically you you stamp on something to make it stand out and then it starts to get deeper and each layer adds that extra layer of i guess value that consumers can then attach themselves to and therefore choose it mm -hmm. i guess that would be a good way to start what do you think you <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I think that, um, you know, if you read if you read any textbook, they'll tell you brand is a perfect blend of tangible and intangible benefits. So, you know, if you're Coke, it's a fizzy brown liquid that makes you, you know, that tastes great. But because of all the meaning that sits around it, it has this uplifting sense that you know come, comes comes through. But the way that I talk about, you know, brands for me are their ideas. You know, yes, they are multifaceted in terms of, 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 of the meaning that they hold. But really, it's the space that you own in, in, in people's minds. And for organisations, they are the thing that bridges your product, your service, your organisation and connects with the customer and it makes it relevant. And to that end, you know, Brand is is merely a conduit for commercial strategy. It's a sort of a, it's a softening of commercial strategy to go with for you, you know. And it's about connecting to groups of people which are either really mainstream or they're tiny niche segments. And it's about finding that what's that point of connection? And that connection is always about some sort of you know shared belief or attitude or benefit that you you know that you you value in your life. Actually, can I, can I just add to that? I really like your thinking yes, around uh, this moment, this idea of 
connection. And I kind of always have felt whenever I think brands, whether it be in the advertising world that I've been in or the corporate world as in Heineken, yeah. I've always found brand uh, um, almost the, the intersection. It's almost like the, the precipice that basically d- that the organizations tend to use to either get lost or get very sharp on. So for example, in a corporate world, you could find yourself in a place where brand can just mean cost. Yeah, absolutely. Right? It's just cost. So let's spend as less as possible on the brand so that we can sell as much more, right? Whereas yeah. I think there is the, the opposite is true, which is that the brand is actually the way to define value. It's actually the sharpest end of the commercial conversation that needs to be thought about and I think that's where I think the problem happens in the world right now, which is when recessions come along, sometimes, and I've seen that in a lot of organizations, the first thing to go is marketing and brand. Always. Um, right? <laughs> Always. And, and isn't that strange that the most important The thing you value... turn off is the thing you may need most, yeah. But it's the easiest yeah. thing to take off the P&L. And then I find the, 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 I think the biggest conundrum that I have always had as a marketeer in big organizations, not so much in advertising. In advertising, you are responsible for creating it and therefore you become the, that's your baby. But the minute you move to the corporate side, the brand sometimes can get discounted at the service of the commercial agenda. And I don't know what uh, you think of that, Richard. Well, I think... I think it depends where the value lies and the, you know, and I think one of the things that you have to establish in any brand is to understand what are the drivers of value and, you know, not all things are equal. And, 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 you know, within a B2B context for, you know, business, business context, you are, you know, brand doesn't have, doesn't resonate in the same way, you know, the personal relationships that people have, um, and so within that corporate space, you can see why brand becomes more functional. And it actually, you know, Flavia, going back to your second question of what, how has it evolved? Mm-hmm. Um, I remember speaking last year about brands were actually, you know, they go back to ancient Egypt and, um, you know, the marks that went on to pots and, um, you know, and so they were just distinguishing marks and they grew over that. And it wasn't until... Basically, you know, the earliest earliest twentieth century that they began to take on more, you know, more of a, a meaning. And it wasn't until it wasn't until the sixties and seventies that you know when you had the birth of positioning that people started thinking about the meaning to individual groups rather than you know I'm just going to make a claim and and I'm you know and, and that claim will be a positive one and I'm going to plaster it everywhere mm-hmm. and if and I'm going to you know and as long as I get the awareness and I can attach some positive meaning to it, people will buy it and that was fine in the 50s when people were just you know exploring new things you know new products I'll try it new products I'll try it um, and um, but you know as we become much more sophisticated now in terms of the brands and our not just our choice, but how we select them. It becomes it becomes a very, you know, different proposition to how you forge that connection with people. But the point is around value. So what are the value drivers? We were doing this big UK gym chain called Fitness First. It's in Germany, it's in all over Asia. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we did when we were creating that brand was to, uh, we, we tracked all of the different touch points and the impact on satisfaction you know it's done through net promoter school and um and and understanding you know where that um where that truly impacted people in terms of retention uh and um and the most valuable thing out out of all of the things that we looked at was the shampoo and the and the towels in the changing rooms they had Mm. the biggest impact on on people's experience and how satisfied they felt at the end of their workout you know yeah. and so when you begin to understand that you start understanding where do you put the value within the customer journey and the types of things that you create for them the things that are going to make them 
you know, especially in a business that, you know, most gyms churn 50% a year. Yeah. So everything you can do. I mean, we worked out that in the UK, with the UK alone, just one market, if we could if we get an uplift of 1% retention, that was 1.1 million quid straight onto the bottom line, you know, and, you know, and it's, um, you know, these things are handy for businesses to know. I see, it's interesting because it's almost like a show of intention, you, you know, of, of, of the brand itself. Those shampoo bottles might not be as important as they seem, but the moment, the moment they're good or they're bad, it just, the, the innate attention to detail that it signifies yeah. for somebody about the brand might be what's actually carrying the weight rather than the physical, you know, quality yeah. of the shampoo itself. But rather the fact that they thought of me enough to do this almost shows an innate brand quality that is attention to detail, which we love about people, we love about leaders, we love about brands, we love about anything, right? So. Even though, you know, people, even though you do that and people will take in their um, empty bottles and they'll, <laughs> they'll pump it full to get just free, um, free shampoo. That's crazy. Quite incredible. <laughs> so actually Dean uh if you're listening Dean actually wrote a question and it was the exact question that I was going to ask you guys next um because of what uh, Anurag you were saying and he said uh in terms of brand value in a b2b context so he's asking about b2b specifically which wasn't necessarily my my go-to but the, I think we should answer it for him in terms of brand value in a B2B context. What is the best way? What has worked to sell this value to stakeholders so that budgets aren't cut and focus isn't lost? <laughs> I think, should I, should I start? Yeah, sure, that? by all means. Um, I think in a B2B context, I think um, I'll give you the Heineken experience. Maybe that's probably the closest I have right on my head. I'm sure others will come. In a B2B context, I think the brand value conversation has to be a conversation between transactional value and transformational value. Now, transactional value is a value that you basically are able to talk to a guy sitting across, in, let's say, a, a pub in the UK or pub in anywhere in the world. And that retailer or that, let's say, the pub lord understands that there is a certain amount of cachet in holding on to a brand like Heineken or the portfolio of brands that Heineken brings to the table. If you could, and, and if you can basically have a conversation with this person to say, the long-term value of holding on to this bucket or basket of brands that I bring to you is way more than the value that you will get from a, from a short-term decision on a, a discounted price today versus tomorrow is a, is a very intelligent conversation to have with a retailer because he understands that. He understands long-term customers because for him, he wants to have a long-term customer retention plan whether it be a retailer or whether it be a distributor. And I think being able to separate the transaction and the, and the transformation, I think is an important way to do it through brands. Mm. And that's where brand stories and brand heritage and brand values and that just not the telling part, it's actually the spectrum. It straddles functionality and quality of product right down to what's the commitment of this particular brand to the long to the category and i think that's where if you were to be able to take the brand conversation you actually don't allow for the discounting that i was talking about earlier to happen hmm. that would be an example that i can think of yeah i think it's i think it's hard <coughs> <laughs> I, th I, I think do, Dean would agree with you <laughs> that it's hard. <laughs> I think that um, I think within a B two B context, I think that you know, and we do a lot of work within B two B as as well as you know, uh, direct, as well as consumer. But um, um, I think there isn't the acknowledgement of the power of brand within B two B, and you know, and as I was saying, you know, just the, the strength of the relationships is often. You know what really drives the value within those businesses but it's certainly you know you can't dispute that without awareness without you know that initial you know standing within the market that you're not even going to be at the game so you know there's a job to do in terms of awareness that's why you see just so many one-dimensional b2b brands but i think that you know the way that and i've seen um 
uh, marketing directors or commercial directors that I've worked with been able to overcome this where they've worked with a board or they've gone into an organization where it's highly transactional and so the first thing to do is you just cut you know you cut the marketing spend you cut, you cut the budget and it comes and crikey I can't believe this is you know I'm, I'm talking about all my answers have been around measurement and tracking um, which is yes it's part of what we do but you know it's what well, we don't do the tracking ourselves um, but you have, but it, but it, it really helps to make your arguments and your points, and especially if you're talking to, you know, a a leadership team which is own, you know, that's what they're going to be focused on, focused on commercial performance. You have to be able to evidence that what you do with the brand is directly, you know, is has an impact in terms of performance. And that's the only conversation that you can have with these guys, and so that's where you have to focus your efforts. Uh, and you know, and that will require some sort of tracking if you've got, you know, a, a bunch of a bunch of skeptics. Uh, but it also requires you to do really good work so that you know it cuts through, um, and and it has, and it has the impact that you require it to have. I, and I just 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 as what you were saying, Richard, which is about this conversation about metrics. I think the most powerful conversation to be had with the with the in a B two B conversation with the brand in the center is to be able to show the connection between consumers and profit. So mm -hmm. what, I, what do I mean by that? If you can be, if you can somehow convince, show and prove that the highest value paying long-term customer believes in brands, mm -hmm. then you have a very interesting conversation that begins to happen because you are able to then speak in favor of brand-led um, revenue and profit management strategies. The, because the minute you put the brand in the center of that conversation, it's, it, it, becomes, it becomes a value driver versus a value depleter. And, and I've had conversations with, and, and I think the, the sales guys in organizations are extremely valuable for that reason. Because if you can get the sales guys in a room with you as a brand marketeer and have a grown-up conversation that says, how do we show that brand-led value is actually more difficult to uh, deplete? Mm. And they can actually show you numbers and show you metrics to say, actually, if I took this particular label off this bottle of beer, I can prove to you that consumers would pay 20% less. Immediately, you get a metric, which is the value of this label is 20% more. And, and you wouldn't know that if you had not spoken to that uh, retail chain manager. And I have found that actually very um, insightful in designing the brand stories around mm -hmm. it. So driving premium through storytelling becomes a job to be done for a, for a, for a brand marketeer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? worth paying more for becomes a job to be done from a brand marketeer. It's not just about awareness anymore. It's about, let me prove through my storytelling that this brand is worth more. And then mm. you have to obviously add a layer of creativity to make that cool and distinctive and da 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 da, da. But the starting objective is different. And I think that applies to B2B as much as to B2C, I guess. So I guess I'm talking about objective settings being yeah. An important part of defining what brand should stand for, hmm. for comms and marketing. Very nice. No, I see, and and uh, I don't know if I'm entirely right, but I think I see when I was scrolling here. I think I see Matt, who's also on the line, Beispiel uh, from uh, formerly at McDonald's. And during my conversation with him, another one of our speakers, and during my conversation with him at the beginning of Open Branding Month, we actually got to a similar topic, where he said that, and I don't remember if. I think it was the CFO, but either way, I think it was a finance guy where, uh, you know, they were talking, what does the brand mean for him? And the guy said, if all of my stores burn down tomorrow, then I could walk into a bank and get the money that I need to rebuild because of the brand that I have. That's the value that it holds, you know, oh, that's it. Very good. which I thought was a very, was very a very good. clear, I don't know, you know, like you very can, <laughs> I don't know if you can get more clear than that. So Matt, if you're listening, <laughs> thanks yet again for the very, <laughs> very for the very crisp, uh, crisp That's definition. Yeah. But 
but I think that I think that this ties a lot into what we were talking about, which was the concept of of a brand promise, which I know is something that we we want you know we want to touch upon. You're talking about storytelling, about you know the worthiness of who you are and things like that. I think obviously a lot of that stems and flows into what you would what you would what you would call creating a powerful brand promise. But my question is, what makes a good brand promise, and how does it differ from brand purpose? If I may ask. Yeah, so I mean, we put we put so much emphasis on the promise um, in within a positioning. So, um, you know, typically when we're defining a brand, you know, a, a, a brand positioning, a brand strategy, a brand narrative, or, you know, whatever you want to you 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 call that, um, it starts it starts with some sort of insight, you know, a deep insight into the customer, the market that um you know then informs the sh- it informs a point of view because actually it's that point of view that really sets you apart and then what we do is we say um you know write a, a narrative and it's got to go on one powerpoint slide it's two or three paragraphs and it says who you are what you do how you do it and why that's relevant and motivating then once we've got that we dis- squish that down into a promise which will be two or three sometimes four words that just really capture you know what that meaning is and then we put three values behind it so a rational one an emotional one and uh aspirational one the the rational one gives the brand it's it's, talks about how you do things and it gives the brand just a bit of a harder edge uh the emotional one just really gives you uh it's more about how you think and um and it's just just gives you a, a bit of a softness to it. And the aspirational one gives you a bit of stretch and it's where you are not today, but what, where you want to take the organization. And that, you know, when we've got these, as, a, as that gives us this platform, but in the middle of that is this promise. And the promise is the thing that links back to that bigger story. If we're trying, when we're thinking about organizations, because we fundamentally believe that, you know, the best brands are built from the inside out, People can, you know, don't go giving people six, eight values. People can remember three things. Give them three values and one promise. Make it as memorable as hell and make sure that it really directs um, them. You know, so it's got to do three jobs. It's got to direct people internally. It's got to, uh, it's got to differentiate you from your competitors. And it's got to inform some sort of action, finally. You know, whether that's, buying something, giving time, giving money, whatever it is that there's an action um, linked to it, and it needs to, to, to get, get to that. But if you can get you know, that, that promise to deliver all of that and these three values, you'll create something that people can really remember internally, but it'll also create a really distinctive and memorable tone um, and tone of voice for, for for your brand if you can do all of those three things and it's just been something that you know over the years we've honed, we've honed down um, so we don't believe in models you know if you're filling in onions of temples or whatever forget it brands don't live in onions and temples they live in the mind they live in ideas focus on the ideas that's that's what really connects with them and i think you know there's in recent years obviously people have took you know vision and mission and purpose and you know essences and all the rest of it for us the promise is the thing because it talks about a unbreakable bond between you and your customer and i think that's you know that's what we promise to deliver to you time and time again and and you know and and, and purposes i think can co coexist and i think there's been an argument of late of whether a purpose or a promise and, and we've done both for um, for clients but we can't operate without without a promise you know a purpose should define beyond the money that we make from the stuff that we do what is it that we're bringing you know mm-hmm. for the party for the rest for the world you know and that's and so when you just focuses on i think it's fine to focus on purpose if what you're doing has true worth and value and if it's something which is fabricated and isn't authentic you know, people just see through it, you know, and I think there's there's lots of brands that have been doing that of late and, um, and that ain't going to get you anywhere. <laughs> any thoughts? Mm. Well, nice. That's I think it's a that. I think it's a really great, you know, what we were talking yeah. about with it's obvious that we're going in this direction of, OK, so 
beyond advertising, beyond the obvious, beyond the obvious metrics, beyond all of this, how can we direct the conversation? How can we yeah. infiltrate the organization? How can we do all of these things? So mm. Anurag, given that you focus so much on you know, transformation, I'm thinking that maybe you can talk about you know, what else is there that brands should think of building you know, themselves beyond advertising, yeah. similar to what, yeah. to what Richard was talking about. Okay, so I can I can come at it from this side. <clears throat> so can I just use the Heineken example because I think that will help illustrate at least my my little competence in this space because I'm not as fluent as Richard is on the way he defines <clears throat> purpose and promise. So I'll just be a bit of a practitioner in that respect. Um, I have always struggled with promise and purpose, so I'll be I'll be candid here. But I think at inside Heineken. I saw a moment of aha when the Heineken organization and the brand team got to a, a, what we call the belief. And the belief, as Richard rightly pointed out, is, is a very deep truth that unites consumers and the true story of the brand. Hmm. And for Heineken, that was to progress, you must cross your borders. That was the belief that we found and crafted. To progress, you must cross your borders. Now, why did that become such an important keystone to then create lots of promises underneath it? So it's almost like the mother yeast. It's like the mother ship is this belief. And why is that belief such an important pivot for the organization and the brand at that time was because it really unified the desire of the consumer for whom for us was the global consumer. Who ever, and there is this global insight that 25% of the male 25 to 34 in the world, research after research tells you the most important driver in their lives is to progress and finding means to progress in life. It's mm. very important. It's a very fundamental desire in, in men. And, and, I, and I focus on men because the beer brand then focused on men primarily because that was the focus of the, the, of the marketing. Now, and the idea of crossing your borders was about leaving your comfort zone. And Heineken was a brand that basically left its comfort zone from the Netherlands and went and became a global beer brand. Mm. So you see, it's the bridge that united the desire of the consumer with the truth of the brand. And the minute you get to that, now I called it belief, but it could be purpose and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not purpose and Richard will correct me. But from <laughs> that came a lot of promises. There came a promise for how will we apply that to Formula One or how will we apply that to Champions League? But how would we apply it to our product stories? See? And we're all trying to tell stories about this idea of striving for, 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 for greatness by leaving the comfort zone and then trying to progress forward. You see? And, but there were lots of stories that came from one mothership story. Yeah, and it should. I think it should. What do you think? What, what do you think it should? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that you know this this single promise. Um, you know, so if let's just take it for some sports teams, right? Because we do a lot of work within sports. Yeah. So McLaren yeah, yeah. Formula One, fearlessly forward. Um, Wimbledon tennis, pursuit of perfection or pursuit of greatness. Um, you know, Ascot the. Um, uh, the race course here in, in the UK that the Queen owns has raised the standard. You know, it's, it's these ideas are there that direct the organisation and they are there to pin off and to give birth to hundreds of ideas this, that, that, come from, that come from this start point. You know, it, it is not, it can never be a one-dimensional thing that feels like it's going out in a campaign you know, it has to just in it, it. It needs to be able to inform every decision that you make, not just in communication, but you know, in terms of HR policy. You know, how you how you how you handle your your people in the the employee, the employee um, journey through the organisation, through to yes, your your comms. 
Um, but every single touch point, every time you interact with, an, with a colleague or, an, um, or, or a customer, you know, that, that you really, this thing should be present. It should underpin it. It should be the foundation. Doesn't mean you say the same thing every time. It'll be dead in the water if you do that. You've got to, you know, it it's, it's means that it informs that it's coming from a place. And that's, you know, that's the, that's the way that these things live and survive. And, and that's how, Claudia, you can actually, as a brand owner, stretch the brand storytelling beyond sales beyond just products, beyond just innovation. And that's what I found that when I was trying to do this whole platform around moderate consumption of alcohol, you have to start somewhere. You can't just start and don't drink and drive because that's too small a story. And it's too generic a story. You have to take the brand, you have to start further back to the truth of what the brand stands for. So the brand is all about demonstrating progress by the confidence of you know crossing your borders or the confidence of getting out of your comfort zone, then that has to then travel into your stories about, okay, then how can I be confident in not drinking too much? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. how do you demonstrate mm -hmm. the confidence of progressing, being progressive, even in a topic which is so uh, uh, dogmatically driven by the governments telling us what to do and what not to do? How do you make that a personal symbol of my own personal signature of that's another way of showing confidence, you see? Yeah. So, and I think that's how you can take and stretch brands beyond their functional or product raison d'etre. And yeah. I think that's where the art and the science kind of come together, I think. And the great brands know how to stretch it, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But then, but uh, yeah. but then I but then I ask but then I ask you know I think the obvious question about that is yeah there's this group of people that have defined this killer brand promise but how you know how do you deliver it across an immensely large organization and ensure ensure that it continuously stays on point which I think are <laughs> there's like the first step and if you get that right great but sustaining change is a whole nother. <laughs> A whole nother, you know, a whole nother beast. I don't know. I don't yeah, know who wants to start, but we spent we we spent a long time. Um, you know, as I said moments ago, um, you know, we believe fundamentally that the best brands are built from the inside um, out and from the bottom up. You know, I believe that leadership teams um, they need to own that conversation mm -hmm. and they need to, to be the people who, um, who who deliver on it and make and uh, and ultimately will will drive it um, but so how do you roll this out well, the thing is it starts it doesn't start when you've come up with the with the idea and that promise itself it starts the moment you decide you're going to do this mm -hmm. so the way that we work with organizations is um, when a you know, as soon as you're going to get to um, embark on this project, we involve as much of the organization as possible. So yes, there'll be, you know, stakeholder interviews um, internally and externally. And yes, all the people who, you know, are on the board, well, you need to build up a picture of what it feels like to work within the organization to then say, you know, if we're going to deliver this vision of the future, you always, you know, you need to start with the um, with the customer service delivery that you want to deliver, and you have to demonstrate to your people that's how I want you to behave by demonstrating to them that this is how you are treating them. So, you know, you have to. So, one, you have to sort of appreciate that you need to understand how the organization operates and what it's like to work in different bits of the organization and to be part of that culture. But equally, we give everyone the opportunity. So we encourage organizations to, um, uh, if they, you know, not everyone, it seems hard to believe, but, you know, not everyone is, not every organization has email. You know, there's lots of people out in the field or on a manufacturing line who don't have an email address. You know, the only way they can, they're lucky if you've got a mobile number to send them a text message. So, you know, we either get it, you know, so they can't always do surveys and sometimes, you know, we'll go and do Google two groups but it doesn't have to be exhaustive what it does have to be is to go and tell the organization that this happened 
then so we sort of get a benchmark and a start point right at the beginning of, of it where we understand the tensions that exist and we understand you know we ask invite people to make comments on what they'd like to see and it's up to you about how much guidance you want to give them about those comments or whether you know and how open you want that to be um, and then and that's you know, as a management team and then we you know so we use that's part of the start point then we you know we go and do some work and then we go back when we've got a couple of routes uh, you know and we talk about building a creative vision so we'll literally go every single touch point what does this look like and then we put up exhibitions and we take over rooms we put you know we take these things on tour we tour around organizations and we get people to um um, to, to give us feedback we give them stickers that have got phrases on them like you know you, you know this will motivate our customers or you know this will make our customers run a million miles you know with their they're hot and they're cold um, and we encourage them to stick these stickers on we give them sharpies they can write these things that you know big format printouts to get them to write on it and you see just a heat map of the things that are working and the things aren't and you know and that's really helpful for us in terms of testing it but you know you obviously need to take the external view on this in terms of some of the decisions that you're making but what it does is it creates advocacy internally and it and it does sharpen your 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 brand um, but people buy into it and they buy into it because they go there's a bit of me in there and I helped them to shape that. And if you can, and that's, you know, whether that's at the first stage of answering a, a really quick survey of just a couple of questions, or it's at the, the, we call them gallery sessions, you know, and then, you know, then people feel listened to. And that's what, it's not the same in Asia, it's interesting, but it, in Western and Eastern Europe, it, you know, in the Western world, we don't, you know, it's not command and control. In Asia, you can just go, this is what we're going to do. And as long as, you know, the top man does that, then, you know, some organizations will follow. But in in the Western world, we don't do that. Hmm. Interesting. <clears throat> just to give you, a, I agree with that point about, um, I can see myself in the solution. I think that's a very, very powerful insight that Richard just mentioned. Uh, I think the, the Heineken context, I, there is another, um, very powerful Trojan horse that I've found useful in transformation is um, is embedding, no, incubating the change in a local market. Don't start the change in the center. Have a vision of what the change could be, but actually incubate it in two absolute opposite regions of the world. So for example, in our case, we would always look for new <laughs> solution big sticky in brazil and in uh i'll, I'll pick a kind of china okay sorry richard what are you saying no no i was just doing you froze you sorry. froze for a second but i think I, I we froze, but I we froze, yeah. but we heard you did you get that yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it was so if you could incubate if you can incubate um a very big problem with a very s simple creative idea in two two ends of the planet and then bring them together back to the center to get the senior leadership to understand the value of it, it flows very fast as well. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So then the cascading effect comes from, it was, it, was, it was born in the places which needed it the most, but it will work in other places that are similar. Yeah. And I have found that the fastest way to create change in organization, whether it be ideas, or whether it be digital transformations of the use of the mix of media. So mm -hmm. go, 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 fix, go try and find a solution on how well Singapore does with the mix of traditional and social media to show the ROI on that and then take it back to the US because you know the US is probably a little bit more traditional. And I'm talking about this in my industry where mm -hmm. the, the industry was a little bit more traditional in terms of the media choices they used. And then maybe take it to Africa and take it to Nigeria and then talk about how that solution can be bespoke and and retooled, but the principles are still the same. And I think that's that I have found that a very great way of co-creating powerful solutions, which otherwise would take a hell of a long time if you try to do it center first. Yeah, yeah. I tell you, I've had a really interesting <clears throat> conversation recently with um, 
a chap who uh, Professor Paul Dolan is his name, and he's he's head of uh, behavioural science at the London School of Economics, and um, um, we do a lot of work in terms of foresight and trying to you know look at data and triangulate data points and go actually what what if this happens what if that happens and as part of that we go and speak to experts and he was he was one that we were speaking to um and um but what was really interesting is just you know because i mean i've read about behavioral economics um but just speaking to a practitioner um and you know and the difference between behavioral economics and marketing, he just laid bare. He went, you know, that's that's where you marketers and, you know, we behavioral economicians just differ because you look for differences. We look for similarities. And he said, you know, I, you know, and, and I understand why that is. And that's ultimately what you're selling. But as a human species, you know, we have evolved over thousands of years. Physiologically, we are you know, identical in every way, you know, all around the world, beyond a four millimeter skin covering that distinguishes some of us to be, you know, different when we're actually all the same. Uh, and, um, and, and what he was saying is, you know, the thing that I'm looking for is in controlled experiments to see where we're all the similar, um, the, exactly the same things that we make and and what you do as a as a brand person is you amplify the difference because you go look at me look at me look at me but the thing is in life is we're more similar than program. right and so you know it's absolutely right and look for the things where you know <laughs> where, where they are the same and you can but you, you know it's people will always criticize you for being overly simplistic unless you can prove it and that's the challenge um, but it's absolutely the right thing to do, and um, and, on, and if you want to move at speed and to have impact, you you know you need to find those markets that are, um, yeah, that they're, they're the same and cluster them together with a similar approach. Hmm. So I'm I'm just wondering, you know, like are brands really not thinking about differentiation in the digital age in the right way? I mean, like has authenticity yet to play? the role that it was intended to play. Um, this is something that maybe, that I know you're passionate about. So uh, I, I wanted to make sure I asked you. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> Go on, Richard. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, when you, the thing, the amazing thing that's happened in recent years is that we now have more data than, than ever before, right? So, um, so you, you know, we know, or, you know, prior to GDPR, you know, we knew so much about about customers, and um, um, and the challenge is is that brands have all had the access to exactly the same data, and you know, and they've drawn exactly the same conclusions. And as brands digitally tra transform, you know, they go online with the same eight tile grid. You know, and then the actions and, and we're getting, you know, it can't be more than two clicks. There's, the experiences are identical. And when you're using the same methodologies and the, you know, the same data points, of course, you're going to end up in the same. And I think, you know, lots of brands have become um, very similar. And I, and I think there's there's huge opportunity. And this is what we'll start seeing now is, is, for brands to really invest in how do you stand out? How can you be different? Um, and I and that will come down to this point of view. And it will come down to, you know, finding different ways to interpret technology in a way which is right for your brands. I mean, you know, I've always said, why aren't, why aren't people talking about the physics, about the way that things moves or sounds, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and, and and how can we, how can we begin to, um, to to just shift um, and enrich the way that the brands perform, but you know it is about having a different promise, and it you know and it is it is about getting to a, a a different point of view on on the world, but then delivering it, even though it'll be through the same channels, but delivering it in a way you know which is somehow better. You know, I, my view is that I think because of and I think COVID has accelerated this. I think we're at a we're at a bit of a, a, a precipice of uh, we've reached a point when 
the differentiator that we will that we are all looking for in brands will no more come from technology technology cannot differentiate brands anymore because like richard said everything is now um formalized there is a format for everything yeah <laughs> his wi-fi is really bad today yeah we keep but he's right he's <laughs> So I think there's, you know, I think there is, you know, there's a format. Um, and so, and that isn't going to change. And there's certain things, you know, it's like when, so as there's really a piece of recent. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I keep getting knocked out of this. I'm really sorry, Flavia. No worries. No worries really at sorry. all. Yeah. Go, yeah. go ahead. No, what I was saying was, <laughs> uh, what I was saying was, I think, and maybe this is where I'm now beginning to kind of move my, I guess my attention towards, which is this idea of, you know, brands have to really embrace being meaningful again. And we've talked about, you know, corporate social responsibility in the past. We've talked about social marketing in the past. We've talked about purpose, but I think there is now has come a time that we have to put words like compassion and creativity in the same conversation. And I really mean that. I really feel that we've kind of disconnected this whole ide ideology of compassion from creativity. And I'll give you an example of this. I was thinking about this last night and I'm sure I'm gonna get um, trashed for this, but I'll say it. I think the, mold, the moldy whopper campaign that won everything on the planet this year is the worst example of creativity in the age that we now live in. Because there is no compassion in that idea. It is an idea that's trying so hard to prove itself that it's a clever idea. And the advertising world and the marketing world has bowed to it and accepted that to be the best. And I think there is a problem there because there is, that is creativity without compassion. Mm. I was reading yesterday or the day before yesterday, 98% of the world now believes after COVID that the world needs to become more equal and become more fair. 98% of the world says that. that. That is a ridiculously high number of people who are saying this world needs a little bit more fairness, a little bit more equality, a little bit more compassion, a little bit more kindness. And I think brands have to understand that. They have to respond to that and not respond to it out of, uh, let's put 3% of our money to do that. No, they have to put it at the center of how they solve problems and the promises they make in the world. Mm. And and I, and I think that there, there are brands that have already done that for the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. For him, for them, it's, it's no big deal. Like, you know, there so, are brands who have, who have basically gone, we are like Patagonia, good example. Patagonia is a brand that has always believed in climate, protecting the climate. Mm -hmm. They continue to be consistent on that topic to the day to day when they create labels which says, vote the assholes out, you know? And the world talks about it. The world applauds it because they have, the, they have the balls and they have the authenticity to be able to stand for something they've believed in for the last 50 years. Hmm. But they just do it using the new channels available. Creativity is coming from a belief, a compassion for a particular cause. They just use the social media channels available today to, to bring it out into the world. And, and I'm sure Richard, you probably have more examples, but I just think that I really want to kind of start talking about language which is much more human in defining what propositions should be so that moldy whoppers don't keep winning awards anymore because they're just a waste of money i think it's i think it's a really Rant interesting over. i think it, i think it's a really interesting <laughs> point that you raise and i think that you know um there's there's no disputing that this moment in time that you know the world people want the world to be a fairer place um and um and and just something we've been thinking about in terms of what's the impact for brands within that and you know does this mean that you know everyone will just be much more humble and um philanthropic in their approach to mm -hmm. marketing and branding you know well i mean what we're doing is I talked about that foresight exercise. It was actually for a, a retailer, uh, and, um, and 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 we were talking specifically about fashion and retail fashion. And if you think about yeah, before COVID, before the pandemic, 
what was what is the biggest um uh, issue threatening fashion is fast fashion and mm. fashion's dirty secret um about its pollutants and its water wastage and all the rest of it um and and actually you've said in up in january there was lots of reports saying this is the thing and it's it's what you know it, it's what will kill fast fast fashion and and it will um but the but actually there's a question here now as as we stand here in november just you know nine months ten months later you, you sit there and go will we revert back to that course of action of where we were that actually uh, people will want to make a stand against this or you know and that and actually it'll be accelerated because i don't think that's going to be the case i think that people have been locked down for 10 months and i think although there is an awareness and a responsibility that is there on people i also think that people are i think people are going to have the biggest party the next spring when people get out of lockdown i think people are going to go you know what let's live in the moment i might spend my money more reason um, uh, more considerably and i might be more conscious about stuff I'm sure as hell going to spend it and I'm sure as hell going to have a bloody good time doing it. And I think that, you know, and I think that um, never lose sight of, 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 you know, how we humans think and our ability to go and enjoy ourselves um, and, you know, sustainability and um, you know, social responsibility are really key and they're massive issues and every brand needs to make sure that they are looking at their impact because you know if you're not yeah you're going to be dead right yeah. but yeah. the customer still you wants know, to have Richard, I... and i think it's just getting that balance i'm sorry, not i'm not sorry. disputing it but um i'm just going no, I, to what degree is it i i just <laughs> feel that you know for example i was just thinking of twitter twitter did a campaign was the only social media brand that came out into the into the us and said please wear a mask Okay. Yeah. Now that's a that's a sign of a brand that has the balls to basically yeah. stand up and say, I'm gonna fact, not only am I gonna fact check somebody who I think is just bullshitting the world, I will also tell the world as a social media brand, I'm gonna take some social responsibility for the whole place. That I think is a stance than what a Facebook has taken or any other social media brand has taken. I just think that's an example that has to be applauded and followed yeah. and built on. Yeah, no, I, I I agree, I agree with you, I do agree. With you. Uh, but see, and I think that yeah. But see, yeah. it's it's interesting because we talk about you know, and Anurag, you're, <laughs> I think this is the interesting part, is that you're so passionate about this side of things, yet you talk about digital transformation. So can you just can can you somehow <laughs> somehow tie the two together? I mean, when it comes to brand thinking and what you can pull from it how do you use something like a focus on meaning and purpose and everything that we've talked about here to actually drive digital marketing i mean you give the example of twitter but how in your head how do these two kind of tie together maybe even at a at a at a at a at a more core level you know to even go into the the space of transformation and change management and things like this but but Flavia, for me, the digital technologies that we now have are the easiest way to scale a point of view. Mm -hmm. We've never had such speed of scaling ever possible by humanity. Humans never had had so much. At one instant, one tweet can travel the entire planet and back within a <laughs> second. Now, what are you going to put on that tweet is the question. What are you going to load that that code with is the question. And I think the the more AI becomes the norm, the more we, we move into a world where machines will tell us how to behave, they are just learning from us. When people say AI is biased, I'm like, they're not, AI is not biased. AI is learning from us. Yeah. So if you want to change AI, you have to change your own language. Mm. And I think brands have a responsibility to coach their fans and followers. Because by the way, I don't think brands are any, any more just things in a shelf. They are a community. Airbnb is a brand built of people. You know, I mean, I'm, uh, Airbnb would not exist without its community of hosts and travelers. It ha doesn't have property anyway, 
but it has a very strong community. So what I'm saying is digital transformation is nothing else but a digital acceleration of a very strong belief in compassionate, meaningful creativity. And mm. that has to become the center of marketeers agenda, not creativity for the sake of cleverness. That age is gone. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Should and, not let it come back. That's and advertising <laughs> and advertising, the advertising industry too frequently, you know, rewards itself for its genius ideas rather than its effectiveness. And, yes. Um, and, and to the people who judge those awards are the peers of the people who are winning them rather than correct. You know, and, and I'm, I, I don't know that that's right anymore. Um, and the other thing that I think you know you said just to pick up on is I think it's really useful for, to start thinking about your customers as fans and followers. You know, instead of stop yeah. thinking about them as customers that you sell to, start thinking about yeah. them as fans and followers, people who you provide content to. You know, but, and yeah. you provide. I, I just, I, I, and I really believe we are now in an age of which I call the network consumer. We're in the network consumer age where everything is connected. So now the only way you can be, you can remain a brand is if you are able to understand the hive and not the bee. Do you know what I mean? You are now talking to the entire hive and trying to manage that conversation. That's your job now. It's to orchestrate. It's no more to create. And I think as a marketeer, to get your head around orchestration is the key driver of creativity is a different engine because now you're going to basically allow the hive to decide what your creativity is going to be. I'll give you a small example. Um, Headspace and Waking Up are two um, apps that are obviously, you guys know about that, but Headspace and WhatsApp's growth is primarily by virtue of its fans and followers recommending it to everybody else. Mm -hmm. And that brand understands that. So for example, Waking Up as an app, Sam Harris's app doesn't advertise. It's got a huge following and it's growing organically. It's growing underground and it's growing because of the digital transformation that's happening in our lives right now. Because people believe that what he says is great and then the, what his values is something that we ascribe to and then we use that to then try and reward other people with that. It's like our compassion shows up and he goes, here's this for free. Try it because I think it's great. It will help you. So, you know, from get to give, I think has to be a mindset shift that marketers have to not just watch, uh, you know, watch from afar. They have to get into it and start making that the core of their propositions. I guess that's my, that's my bringing it to the center of the brand, I guess is the point. Yeah. Nicely put. I think we're at the end of time, unfortunately, but I I think I'm left, <laughs> to be honest, given given Anurag's reaction to the Whopper, I think I'm left with the sense that maybe part of our industry has a little bit of a clinical narcissist <laughs> complex going on, um, which might be something worth looking more into, to be honest. But other than that, I think it's it's undoubtedly true that what we've what we've proven, I think, even in a matter of 60 minutes, to be honest is the transformational power of, of branding. And I think that's at a, at a, at a how shall I say this, uh, not only at an organizational level, but all the way down to the exact marketing that you do, the exact words that you write on a piece of paper, the exact number of values that you have and why that's important. I think there are just so many elements that I, you know, to, to be fair, this is why we're trying to focus even us as a brand on branding specifically because there's, there would be so much more there that we could go into, but strategic branding and what it can do for people and for organizations and for communities and for countries, et cetera, I think we all agree and we tend to continue to agree with every speaker that it's just remarkable. And because it's always been stuck in this niche and hasn't been understood very well, and it's always been looked at as just the visual side of things, its power, I think, has yet to be, has yet, yet to be unleashed. Um, just like Anurag was saying, and Richard, I think just like you prove with your work every day. So um, to be honest, guys, I just want to say thank you for helping for helping me do that, and for thank helping you. our team do this. And um, and I, you know, we'll talk soon. But thank you to everyone that joined us today, and definitely keep keep following along. We have new master classes every day until December third, and then um, we have the lives, of course, with our speakers. So definitely go go to the website. The full schedule is on rebelsrulers.com. And until then, I 
I don't know. I say goodbye for now, I suppose. And thank you guys again, really, for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Flavia.